Jesus celebrate.
like that bird up in the sky. Life has taught me how to fly. For now I know what I can be. And now Well, good morning and welcome to our Easter service. Um, just like a couple of weeks ago, Indianola it, it will be leading most of the service, but we're glad to have Glenn as our guest speaker today. Um, <clears throat> have a lot of multiple members of the congregation, plus some another ministry of music um, by our Meyer Hardy Crowley family coming up. So something to look forward to. Our welcome today from Doctrine and Covenants 116, uh, 3C and D. Remember the worth of the souls is great in the sight of God. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh as he suffered the pain of all of us that we might repent and come unto him. And he has risen again from the dead that we all, that he might bring us all to him on the conditions of repentance. Please join us in the responsive reading. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. it. We'll begin with our first hymn of praise. Um, now the green blade rises, sung by Daniel and played on the piano by Daniel. M482. The green blade rises from the buried grain. We eat that in dark earth many days has lain. Love lives again, that with the dead has been. Love is come again like wheat arising green. In the grave they laid him, loved by hatred slain. Thinking that he would never wake again. Laid in the earth like grain that sleeps unseen. Love is come again like wheat arising green. 
For he came at Easter like the risen grain. He that for three days in the grave had lain, raised from the dead, my living Lord is seen. Love is come again like wheat arise in green. When our hearts are wintry, grieving or in pain, your touch can call us back to life again. Fields of our hearts that dead and bare have been, love is come again like wheat arise in green. The scripture for today's Disciples to Dinner's response is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 15, verses 1 through 3. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures. As this pandemic continues, we search for new ways to share our offerings of our time, our talents, our tithes. By sharing through e-tithing or by sending a check to your congregational financial officer or your pastor or to the mission center, you are helping to continue the work of Christ. Paul will now read a prayer written by Jamie and Barb Tankersley, especially for this Easter Disciples' Generous Response. Our risen Lord, we thank you for food and we remember the hungry. We thank you for health and we remember the sick. We thank you for friends and we remember the friendless. We thank you for freedom. And we remember those who are enslaved. We realize you do not ask us to give our lives on a cross. Instead, you ask us to give our lives in service to others. Accept now our offerings to you uh, this hour, that they may be as acceptable to you in your sight. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Easter season has customs or traditions. Can you think of any Easter customs? Um, every Easter, me and my family have a special lunch or dinner. Okay, any others? Mm, Easter egg hunt okay. and kind of gifts. Oh, well, there's another custom that's a bit more subtle and involves color. What color is Easter? Blue. Blue? Well, if we were in a church building instead of meeting virtually, the altar would have a cloth on it and it would be white. Can you guess what color the altar cloth would have been for the last few weeks? Uh, white or purple? Oh, that's a very good guess. I'll give you a hint. It's this color. What color is that? Purple. Purple. Every now and then we change the color of the cloths on the altar, but we just don't pick any color. We have reasons for each color we place on the altar. Through the years, Christians have come to associate different colors with different religious ideas. It's a custom, like the Easter greeting or Easter lilies. We have other altar colors. Sometimes we have red, green, blue, or even black altar colors. They all have special meanings. But let's concentrate on the altar color last week and the color this week. Here's a question for you to think about. Why was our altar color purple the last week? And why is it white this week? Purple is the color of royalty, the color of kings. Why? Well, purple dye was very expensive hundreds of, hundreds of years ago. Only people who were rich could afford purple cloth. Kings and queens were among the few people to own anything purple. 
Last week was Palm Sunday. We were celebrating the day that the people shouted to Jesus and he came to Jerusalem as if he were a king. So the color for Palm Sunday is the color of kings, purple. Purple has another meaning. It is also the color of penitence, of feeling sorry. And so purple was on our altar for the last 40 days while we observed the church season of Lent, a time during which Christians can concentrate on their relationship with God in preparation for the observance of Holy Week and Jesus dying on the cross for us. But for the moment, this is behind us. This morning, we are celebrating Easter. What color would you pick to symbolize Easter? Um, I would have picked a light blue. Light blue? Well, I think I would pick yellow for Easter. It's joyful, it's a spring color, it's the color of so many flowers such as daffodils. It's the color of sunshine and longer days which come at Easter time. It's the color of an egg yolk and an egg is a symbol of Easter. New life breaks out of an egg and can make us think of Jesus breaking out of the tomb. If it were up to me, the altar would be bright yellow this morning, but it doesn't matter what I would choose. The church over many centuries has chosen the color white, sometimes with gold, to remind us that Jesus is born anew and has washed our sins away and made our hearts as white as snow. The color figures in today's gospel story. The women come to the tomb and find the men there in dazzling white clothing. White is the color we put on the altar for the most special worship celebrations, like Easter. White is a color we associate with celebration and closeness to God. Get into the habit of checking the altar when you go into the church every week. See what color it is and ask yourself, why is the altar this color this morning? And for the next 50 days, the altar is going to be white. The color, I wonder what color will be next. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We will now continue with the next hymn, 475, Lift Your Glad Voices. Lift your glad voices in triumph on high, for Jesus is risen and we cannot die. Vain were the terrors that gathered around him and short the dominion of death and the grave. He burst from the fetters of darkness that bound him, resplendent in glory to live and to save. Loud was the chorus of angels on high, the Savior is risen and we shall not die. Glory to God in full anthems of joy, the being he gave us death cannot destroy. Sad were the life we must part with tomorrow, if tears were our birthright and death were our end. But Jesus has cheered the dark valley of sorrow, will rise from the dead and immortal ascend. Lift your voices in triumph on high, for Jesus is risen and we shall not die. Each week, we hear a locally authored peace moment in addition to the prayer for peace. Be blessed with these devotional thoughts. This week's Peace Moment is by Deb Crowley, and the prayer is by Steve Bowley. Years ago, on an Easter Sunday, we were resting after a full morning of church activities. Our three-year-old son, Dustin, lay on the floor, hands lifted in the air, staring at his palms. He asked, Mom, when I die, will the nails hurt? Not understanding his question, I queried further. He replied, you know, like when they put the nails in Jesus' hands and he died, will it hurt? A profound question from a child. 
I explained that people don't usually die from nails pounded in their hands or, or being hung on a cross, but I began to wonder, as disciples, do we feel the pain of nails wounding our hearts at times? Some, like Martin Luther King Jr., suffer torturous deaths on behalf of Jesus' mission, or like Mother Teresa, give their entire lives to serve and suffer on behalf of fellow beings. We, in pursuing Christ's mission, are called to serve people in need. We must engage in difficult, heart-wrenching situations and conflicts. As our discipleship deepens, we experience pain from the nails of a shared burden, nails of oppression, nails of greed, nails of injustice. Yes, I responded to my son, sometimes the nails hurt. But because of the resurrection, we are healed, strengthened, and receive hope. As we lift up our hands, God reaches down, touches, heals, receives the pain, and fills us with peace. From Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Please join me now in our prayer for peace. Easter God, hallelujah! What hope for peace you provide in the resurrection of your son. Like the despairing and scattered disciples after the crucifixion, we sometimes feel that all hope of Christ's peace is lost. There is so much division in our world between religions and religious people, between countries, between political viewpoints, and among neighbors friends, and even family members. How can we hope for peace? Then Easter dawns, a new day for hope. Like the early disciples, we wonder, can it be true? Is the peace of Christ still alive? Will the living Christ bring unity out of so much division? In Easter, we hear your resounding yes, Lord, and we hear your call to be disciples of peace, the ones who recognize the risen Lord and live and act his peace in the world. Easter God, challenge and lead us in the ways of peace. We pray in the name of the risen one. Amen. And so there in Jerusalem on that Friday, on that darkest of days, Joseph of Arimathea obtained permission from Pilate to take Jesus' body away. And so he was buried according to Jewish custom. His body was wrapped in linens and spices. And because it was the day of the Passover for preparation, they laid his body in a tomb in the garden right next to where he had been crucified. If you had been a follower of Jesus, it was the darkest of times. The 19th chapter of John ends with these words, they laid Jesus there. In that sentence was the defeat of life, the defeat of Jesus' disciples. It was the defeat of Jesus. In that sentence was the defeat of God. They laid Jesus there. But then, the 20th chapter of John begins. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came into the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. 
So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The story of Easter is the story of the empty tomb. If you were to travel to Jerusalem today and enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you could look in and see the traditional site of Golgotha, the skull-shaped rock where Jesus was crucified. And just as our scripture tells us today, very close by, just a few steps away really, is the traditional site of the garden tomb where Jesus' body was laid. Millions of pilgrims have come by to stare into that empty tomb. To look into the void, it's dark, it's solemn, and let me tell you that just as Mary found on that first Easter morning, those millions of pilgrims saw one thing, that Jesus was not there. Something caused Mary to get up early that morning. It must have been hard to get out of bed. She was in mourning. Her whole world turned upside down, justice completely gone, righteousness completely defeated. Why did she go to the tomb? To bring spices? To weep, perhaps? To pray? It was still dark when she arrived. But Mary was not to find her Lord in death or in mourning or in tears. The rock had been rolled away. His body was missing. What must have been racing through her mind beyond terror and amazement, no one knows. But she ran to Peter and the others and shouted in the breaking of the dawn light, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. In racing to the tomb, where Peter and the other disciple, what were they thinking? They likely doubted Mary's story that his body was gone, but they had to see for themselves. The story is rushed. It's frantic. The other disciple outran Peter, and he got there first, and he saw the scattered linens, and then he pulled back. He sensed that Peter needed to go in ahead of him, but he saw something else, something odd. The headpiece was not scattered. It had been neatly rolled up and placed carefully there. What was going on here? Robbers wouldn't have done that. Roman centurions wouldn't have done that. Who had taken Jesus' body? 
We are his disciples, they must have been thinking. Who else would respectfully take his body and roll up the linens? What was going on? At first they had doubted Mary, but everything she had said was true. And so the scriptures tell us that seeing the evidence, the linen, the towel rolled up, that he saw and believed. Mary had told the truth. But what did the truth mean? The scripture tells us that they did not yet understand. And so they simply went home. But Mary remained, weeping, praying, and for some reason, in all of her tears, in all of her confusion, she looked into the empty tomb again. And she saw the two angels, and they asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? Mary was weeping because all she could see with her eyes was an empty tomb, a void, an emptiness. And then she turned and saw the one she thought was the gardener, and he asked the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? But Mary still, even though it was Jesus standing right here in front of her, speaking to her, could only see her version of the truth, the empty tomb. Then Jesus identifies himself to her by calling her name, Mary. Rabbi, she responded. I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Jesus then commissions her to go and tell the others. And she runs back and bursts into where they were and shouts, I have seen the Lord. A couple of years after we started the Community of Christ Church plant in Covina, California, Linda Reed asked me to fill in for her in our new program of delivering Wednesday love lunches to the homeless. One of our first deliveries was to Robert, a man in his 70s, in a wheelchair, missing both legs, his neck in a brace, and he was living behind a gas station. There I was in Covina, Kavina, a community I had known virtually all my life, where I had been worshiping for the last two years. How could this be? I wanted to scream. I wanted to cry. But just that very moment, another homeless man, David, approached the car, pushing a shopping cart very slowly. Sorry I'm so slow, he said. I got to use the cart. His body was leaning over the cart, and I looked down, and he had only one leg. I handed him a lunch and a bottle of water out the window, and I was dazed. Is this all I can do? I was like Mary. I was in the darkness. I saw the empty tomb. I saw what was missing, but I didn't see what was there. We moved on. We delivered lunch to people living in and outside a motel. I was trying to process the evidence in front of me. Where are these people? How many are there? Why are they here? Like Peter, who saw the linens and saw the rolled up towel, I saw the evidence, but I couldn't put two and two together. And so bewildered, I just went on. Scott and Sharon were with me in the car, and Scott directed me to drive up by the end of the freeway exit, where a man was holding a sign asking for money. Are you hungry? Scott yelled out the window. A young man in his 20s, very thin, turned around and ran to the car, very hungry. Scott asked his name, handed him a brown bag lunch and a bottle of water, and then I sped away because I didn't want to hold up the traffic that I could see coming behind me. And at the next traffic stop, a man in a truck pulled up beside us and yelled out of his car window, is that how you pay for your fancy Cadillac? You drive around town and collect money from the homeless? Scott was confused by this accusation and said, no, we're, we're from the church. We're delivering lunches. The man scowled back. I wrote down your license plate. The man was an eyewitness. He had seen it with his own eyes, but he couldn't recognize the scene for what it really was. Just like Mary who saw Jesus, who heard his voice, but was so focused on the empty tomb that she couldn't see who was really there, Jesus. This man at the intersection was so focused on his anger at seeing the homeless begging that he couldn't see what was really happening, that someone was feeding the hungry. Throughout the day, 
I had been with Scott looking for homeless people, but throughout the day, I also started to recognize that some of those hungry and homeless were people I knew from my church plant. Steve and Sharon and Terry and Richard were all Christians who had been coming to church. Every single person we delivered a meal to that day was thankful, appreciative, and wanted their name written down on our list, and they wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be seen. And suddenly there it was. I stopped looking at the empty tomb. Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these children, you have done it unto me. What defined these people living on the streets of Kavina was not their homelessness. It was that they are beloved children of God. When you look at the most powerful among us, a senator or a president, when you look at the least among us, a homeless youth begging at the end of the freeway off-ramp or a drunk talking to himself on a park bench, do not see the empty tomb that is in them. See Jesus. Here in Lamoni Heartland Mission Center, in Community of Christ, we too are called to peer into the empty tomb and see the living Christ. But in doing so, we cannot help but be transformed. Easter would be an empty celebration indeed if it did not transform us. We celebrate the joy of this day as the reality of the resurrected Christ shapes us in the name of the Christ of faith. And so we ask, are we moving toward Jesus, the peaceful one? In his closing message at the last World Conference, the president of the Community of Christ, Steve Easy, shared these words. He said, some authors conclude Jesus was the prototype or forerunner of a new peaceful humanity. They emphasize Jesus' peaceful manner. Even when he experienced persecution and violence by crucifixion, he stayed true to his peaceful nature without returning violence for violence. His steadfastness on the cross as he suffered horrible violence reveals the truth that our common redemption and calling in Christ is to be peaceful humanity. President Vizi went on, what if baptisms, confirmations, and observances of the Lord's Supper in community of Christ emphasized that calling in addition to conventional meanings? How might we speak and interact differently as disciples of the peaceful one? Scripture testifies that all creation waits with eager longing for peaceful humanity to appear on the world stage to turn the tide of hate, agony, and destruction. With that in mind, the central question raised by our text looms even larger. Are we moving toward Jesus, the peaceful one? And in words of counsel to the church offered at the conclusion of that sermon, the prophetic voice was heard from President Beasy. He said, technology presents opportunities for involvement in sacraments by priesthood members and participants in separate locations. The First Presidency will act in its calling as chief interpreters of scripture, revelation, and church policies to provide procedures for offering sacraments in new situations while upholding essential meanings and symbols of the sacraments. As the church explores new opportunities for sharing sacraments, direction will come as needed through inspiration and wisdom. Additional meaning is waiting to be discovered in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Renewing covenant with Jesus Christ includes the call to live as peaceful human beings who personify Christ's peace. Spiritual blessing will be experienced when this call is emphasized as a vital aspect of the sacrament. Cherish opportunities to be spiritually formed by Christ's sacred meal of remembrance reconciliation, renewal, and peace. Then go with conviction into the locations of your discipleship and be the peace of Christ. As you do, you will discover a variety of ways in which spiritual community forms and flows as expressions of the gospel of peace. Trust what is being born. Have faith in divine purposes. Persist in hope. 
once Mary got past seeing the void, the emptiness, the empty tomb, she saw the Christ and she was commissioned to tell the others. She ran with excitement and proclaimed, I have seen the Lord. We too this day have seen the empty tomb and we have seen the Lord. Who will you tell? The Passover was the greatest of the festivals and was attended by every adult male. Its historical origin went back to the moment when a reluctant pharaoh had to allow the enslaved Israelites to go free. It was for this celebration the disciples asked Jesus, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Jesus sent them to the city where they found a large upper room furnished and ready. There they prepared Passover. Jesus had the feast and made it his own. It was here in the upper room while they were eating. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is prepared or poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins.
All are welcome at Christ's table. The Lord's Supper or communion is the sacrament in which we remember the life, death, and resurrection and continuing presence of Jesus Christ. In community of Christ, we also experience communion as an opportunity to renew our baptismal covenant and to be formed as disciples who live Christ's mission. Others may have different or added understandings within their faith traditions. We invite all who participate in the Lord's Supper to do so in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. As the prayer is read on the bread and wine, please kneel as much as you are able. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and blood of your son and witness to you, O God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your son and always remember him and keep the commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Our next hymn is Jesus Christ is Risen Today, hymn 476 in Community of Christ Sings. is risen today alleluia our triumphant holy day alleluia who did once upon the cross alleluia suffer to redeem our loss alleluia to the tomb the world memory rich and offering alleluia asking where might jesus be alleluia savior come to set us free
Now may the re resurrection power of the Father's love, the redemptive power of the Son's ministry, and the continuing healing power of the Spirit's presence enable you to move through life's adversities confidently, joyously. The Lord has risen. Go in peace. Thank you.